Well, hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode. From the Kodak Brownie onwards, popular cameras like these have documented the lives of ordinary people. They're stylish, they're simple, they're easy to use, and if you've never shot film before, they're a great way into shooting your first roll. They're also a load of fun, and today we're going to look at one of the nicest, and it's this camera, the Olympus Trip 35. These cameras were made in the millions. There were 10 million of this model made. They were made from 1967 all the way up to 1984, so they had a very, very long production life. And the reason for that, well, it's quite simply a great camera. It's very nicely made. It feels like a quality piece of kit in the hand. And perhaps best of all, it has a 40 millimeter f2.8 Zwicko lens. This is a really nice little camera. It's an auto exposure camera. And when you set it to auto, it shoots in program uh, mode, which means that the camera chooses both the aperture setting and the shutter speed. Now, when it comes to shutter speeds, there's not a great deal of choice on this camera because it has only two, one fortieth of a second and one two hundredth of a second. But it does have the full range or a pretty full range of aperture settings from f2.8 right the way up to f22. And those are changed using this little dial on the back of the lens here right next to the body. So you can see it goes from 2.8 right the way around to f22. This camera doesn't need any batteries despite it being an auto exposure model. It has a selenium cell on the front of the lens here and that selenium cell powers all of the electronics of the camera. You will never run out of batteries using this camera and that I think is one of the reasons it sold so well. This really is a go anywhere camera. Focusing is a very simple affair. It's a zone focusing camera and you can see that it has these fairly simple symbols to help you determine the distance. So a very simple little camera with no pretensions to be anything other than a very simple little camera, but a very, very nice one. Now one of this camera's nicest features, in fact I think it's the nicest feature, is right on the front here. It's this, the lovely little Zwicko f2.8 40mm lens. Let's give you a closer look. And there are the magic words, Zwicko made in Japan. This is a very, very nice little lens. It's a very sharp lens. It's a very crisp lens. It's got great contrast. It's a very, very nice little lens indeed, and it's made some really nice images. It's likely to be a Tessar design, I would have thought. Apparently there are four elements in this lens. It is a simple lens, um, but the Tessar design is a simple design that gives very sharp results, and I think more than likely this is, in fact, a Tessar. But be that as it may, it's a great little lens and it will make you some really, really nice images. You do need good light to use this camera, especially if you're using 100 ISO film, as I was. The minimum focus distance of the lens is only three feet or a meter, so you're not going to be able to get too close to your subjects. Um, it's a fixed focal length camera. You can't change lenses on this camera. This is the lens you get and this is the lens that you stay with. But none of that matters because it's a complete little photographic kit in its own right. Now, I do like very much the 40 millimeter focal length. I loved it on the Voigtlander 40 mil that I tried a little while back. I loved the Konica 40 mil that I tried a little while ago. And this camera is one such. This camera has a fixed 40 mil lens. There are times when 50 mil is just that bit too long and similarly 35 mil can be just that bit too wide. 40 millimeter seems to be the perfect focal length, certainly for street photography and for lots of other kinds of photography too. It's 
I don't know, there just seems something right about it. They do say that 50 mil is roughly equivalent to the field of view of the human eye, but I don't know, I find 40 mil much more conducive and a much more natural focal length to work in. So you can bet that I really enjoyed shooting this camera because entirely of that 40 mil focal length. Now this is a popular camera so it has a very simple exposure system. It's best shot in auto and in order to do that I'll just show you on here. Let's have some focus please. In order to do that what you do is turn the dial to the A mark which is at the far end of the scale. This is a camera designed to be shot in auto, so that's what I'd advise doing with it. And in fact, that's what I did with it. I didn't use the manual settings at all, apart from one shot where there wasn't enough light. And I just nudged it off auto onto 2.8 and got a slightly underexposed shot. This is a really good exposure system. It really works well. And if the camera tells you there's not enough light, there really isn't enough light. You will know when there's not enough light, at least when you're in the auto setting, because when you look through the viewfinder, a little, I'll block the lens, a little red flag comes up to let you know that you just don't have enough light. And I don't know if we can actually see that. So there's the low light warning. And in fact, the camera's locked there and it won't fire and so if you see that little red flag coming up when you push the shutter button you'll know you don't have enough light to take the shot nice and simple nice and easy the zone focusing system is very simple to use very easy and most of the time it works out okay there's no focusing aid on this camera there's no range finder there's no auto exposure uh, there's no SLR system of looking through the lens to focus. It's entirely manual focus, but it actually is pretty easy. So we've got, what have we actually got there? We've got one person, two people, more than two people, and mountains. So don't worry, it's not a camera that only photographs people or mountains that will be a bit restricting I think I did get it wrong a couple of times it's not absolutely foolproof you do have to think about it a little bit probably a little bit more than I did in fact and I did find that I'd missed focus on a couple of shots but also I got some happy accidents out of those messed up shots so it can work well in that way too you know there is an unpredictable element in film photography especially when you're using very old cameras and that unpredictable element can sometimes come together to create some really nice happy accident shots some pieces of industrial design perfectly capture and encapsulate their time and I would humbly suggest this is one such. Just look at the way it's styled. Let's have a closer look. It's a 1960s camera and it encapsulates the stylistic thinking of that time. It's got a space age look. The 60s was a time when anything was possible. Apollo, Concord, it's shiny, it's gleaming, it's got straight lines, it's got this beautiful, selenium cell shroud around here this camera perfectly captures the feel the thinking the philosophy of the time when it was designed and as such it's a very beautiful thing and i've no hesitation in the spirit of the 1960s when it was designed of pronouncing it and giving it the title of very very groovy now you might think as a camera with a relatively wide aperture of f2.8 that this lens could make a little bit of blur. Well, you'd be kind of right and kind of wrong. In theory, yes, it can. 
40mm lens with an f2.8 aperture, shooting close can make some nice background blur, but that's not what this camera is about. And remember, much of the time, even most of the time, it's not going to select for you shooting in auto, it's not going to select that widest 2.8 apertures. Most of your shots are going to end up at around f5.6 to f11 or thereabouts. So this is not a camera you should use expecting to make a great deal of background blur. It will do it if you push it, but it doesn't naturally like it. And sometimes, because it has a diamond-shaped aperture, which, let's see if you can see that. So, I don't know if you can see, you should be able to see in there the aperture opening and closing as I push this shutter button. If you can't see it, take my word for it, it's a diamond shaped aperture because it has only two leaves to control it. So what happens very often is if you have specular highlights, point light sources in the background, what you see are tiny little diamonds and they're not very pleasing actually. Um, and and they don't really give a very nice feel. They don't appear that often, I must admit. Much of the time this camera gives quite large depth of field. But when those little diamond shapes do appear, they can be quite distracting. Although they do give your shots a unique sort of feel. The youngest of these cameras is now approaching 40 years old, so these are old machines. So you will need to check that yours is a good one before you buy. Fortunately, there aren't that many faults that seem to appear on these cameras. They do seem to be pretty reliable. One fault that you may find is a sticky aperture and they do suffer from that. It can be fixed. It's not a difficult fix. And in fact, there are people who specialize in these cameras and can fix them up very easy for you or can even sell you a good one if you don't want to bother with risking the likes of eBay or Amazon. Sticky aperture is a fault to watch for. Also watch for any other fault that you'd look for when you're buying a vintage lens or a vintage camera. Make sure the lens isn't scratched. Uh, make sure the camera fires as it should, make sure there's no mould, fungus in the lens. A tiny bit of dust is acceptable. Most old lenses will have a little dust inside them. So dust isn't necessarily a deal breaker, but fungus, mould, uh, heavy internal dust, scratch into the lens, find a better one. But don't forget 10 million of these cameras were made, so there is always a better one out there. Aside from that, it's reliable. I've been using this camera for a little while. I've had no problems with it. Uh, the selenium cell uh, still works fine. I've found selenium cells to be pretty reliable over time, despite reports that they can very easily fail and usually do fail. Actually, I've not found that. I've found them to be very reliable and very long lived. So it's a good little camera, it's well made, it feels nice in the hand. It's got that classic 60s slash 70s styling. It's got this space age selenium cell fixed on the front there and it's a fantastic little machine. As far as prices go, well, these cameras have become quite popular and I think largely because they're so easy to use and they've got a great lens um, really for the reasons that they were bought all those years ago in the first place. I've seen these cameras on sale for over a hundred pounds but again don't pay that price. Um, buy it now prices are almost always inflated. A more accurate price for one of these can be found by looking at auction prices and on auction prices these go for between 40 to 70 pounds. And I think that that is a real bargain because for your money, you're getting a camera that you can take anywhere. It doesn't need any batteries. It shoots on the beautiful medium film and it's a really stylish looker too. 
I don't think you can really go too far wrong if you find a good one of these. Buy one, try one. I guarantee you'll enjoy it. So, that's it from me for now. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and ring that bell before you go. And if you like the content on this channel and you'd like to help it grow and develop, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash xenography. As ever, thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time for some more xenography. <laughs>